Well, good morning, Scottsdale Worship Center. My name is Timothy Siegel, and that's right, another Tim. So I, there's four of us now that I'm aware of, so I think we can start a quartet here pretty soon. So I'm, uh, I'm part of the hospitality ministry and also part of the community wellness initiative that's soon to be on its way. How did I get here? So my story is that um, I met a couple of card sharks by the name of Sharon Howard and Lucy Lawrence at a mutual friend's house during the pandemic where we had begun to play cards as fellowship. And uh, I, I never did pick up the game because there's just way too much math involved for me. But you know, during the course of our games, Sharon and Lucy began to share about Scottsdale Worship Center, how wonderful this place was, how wonderful you all were, what a place of healing and growth that this community was. And I found my spirit hungry for what they were talking about. And they said, Tim, you should come and visit. And so, in fact, I did. And when I came to visit, I met Pastor Chris and Pastor Jen, and I met many of you and the rest of the staff, and it was just like they said, only even better. So, Getting back to that card game quickly. I'm just in case you're wondering who won. It was me. <laughs> because here I am, and you now are my new family. So, please, if you're physically able, won't you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word? Our text today is going to be from Mark 6. Um, this will be, uh, excuse me, verses 14 through 29. This has to do with the death of John the Baptist. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. And that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of the old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but... Because of his oaths 
and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately, the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Thank you. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Thank you. Okay, Jen, you Thank get you, the Tim. opener on this one. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, that's quite a story, right? right? My goodness. Probably weren't expecting that today when you came to church. <laughs> Real pick me up. I know. Because right. in John's gospel, sorry, Mark's gospel, we're, we're in Mark, aren't we? Yes. Not John. Yeah, I know. I'm getting know. all these people confused. There's so many names today, actually. I'll do my best. We're in week two of our Thorns to Thrones series where we're walking through the gospel of, yes, Mark. And at the very beginning, we see John the Baptist, and he makes this like big dramatic entrance, right? right? He is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He's got his cool camel's hair outfit on and he's <laughs> eating locusts and honey. He's like a survivalist in the desert. He's just this larger than life character who's been sent ahead to prepare the way for the Messiah. So, I mean, they've been waiting for 400 years for the coming of the Messiah, there's, you know, the years of silence and, and it seemed like God was absent at the time and now John the Baptist is here and he is ready to prepare the way and get the people ready and he's preaching, a, you know, a baptism of repentance and the whole nation is like turning back to God. It's quite amazing what's going on and then there's this, yeah. this story that we have just a couple chapters into Mark's gospel. You know, we might ask ourselves, well, you know, why did it have to end like that? Right. Why did this happen, and why do we need to know about this, you know, really? Um, why did it happen this way? Yeah. This sad and kind of tragic ending to this amazing prophet of God with this powerful destiny and legacy. This morning, as we are continuing our series on Thorns to Throne... Part of our faith journey is with Christ includes the need to face the reality of the unwanted right. and the unexpected right. in life, right? Right, right. Uh, you, can't, you can't go uh, too far in Scripture without experiencing some of these, what we might call dark realities. And what, is, what I find a little bit interesting is that too often, and not taking pot shots at, at uh, myself or, or my fellow pastors, but too often, we just skip over the text that doesn't sell well. Like, you know, I mean, like the gospel, the, the good news, and you look at this and like, that ain't good news. And it doesn't present, well, it definitely does not sell books, I promise you that. So this is not going to be a sermon that will sell books, but here's the reality it's the truth of the gospel, and we've got to put it in a whole context. There is a, a verse, it's one that has always been striking to me from Proverbs, uh, in among all the amazing uh, wisdoms out of Proverbs, Proverbs 29, says it this way, uh, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, uh, but blessed is he who keeps the law. I just remind you that prophetic vision uh, ultimately the divine revelation of God is what's being spoken of there. The prophetic vision. So let's just connect the dots. If there's no prophetic vision, if there's no divine revelation of God or God's word, in this case in the Old Testament, the law, if there was no law, then the people cast off restraint. Well, this is the same thing. The idea here is the same that happened in Exodus 32, where we see that when uh, Moses is up and receiving the, the, the tablets and the commandments and the, the word of the Lord, the divine revelation. During that time, the people, Aaron and the people, failed in that space to, to be attentive to the revelation of God. And so instead, they cast off restraints and did what they wanted to. And ultimately, it led to the greatest discouragement, is, 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 is a way to say it. 
in a broad sense. And it's what happens, and the reason I'm bringing this up, this is what happens if we fail to look and consider all of the gospel, A to Z, all of God's word. Too often, what we do is we narrow our focus and we, we set ourselves up for discouragement, for failure, because here's what happens. Life. <laughs> right? Yeah. Life happens, right? And, and, and in the midst of life, there's all these troubles. And you say, well, there, there might be a tendency. I'm just going to gloss over that. And as, as long as I have enough, and here's what we might say, as long as I have enough faith, then it's almost like saying, well, then life isn't going to happen the way it happens for everybody else. Well, all you have to do is look at this story. Because this was a mighty man of God. And it did not go, I promise you, it did not go the way he had been thinking. He was, he literally lost his head over this whole thing. And we sit here today and we're like, oh, dear God. So where there's no prophetic vision, people are cast off. So here, 2022, if we fail to consider the whole counsel of God's word, we're going to be without restraint. We're going to find ourselves discouraged when really we are called not to be uh, undercomers, we're called to be overcomers, and, and our Amen. thought today was really, we're invited to be survivalists, not fatalists. So we don't operate with a mindset that, well, what happens, what happens. No, we've been invited into the kingdom of God, and we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're inviting in an attitude that says, God, no matter what, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. And in fact, some of the greatest, anybody agree with this? Uh, honestly, that, that you've experienced where it's during some of the hardest times, some of the most difficult times, where God is able to be revealed in big, big ways. So that's part of God's kingdom coming is your testimony that no matter what, I'm an overcomer in Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen? That's right. Amen. Amen. Let it be. Let it Amen. be for us. Amen. So a couple of years ago, I bought Chris this book for his birthday, and it's called The Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook. <laughs> and uh, you ever buy something for your spouse, and it's really for you, but you give it to them because, you know, you think they should have it too. So this has some really important... You still like those golf clubs? I bought you. I do. Okay. Yeah, they sit in the corner. They look really nice. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. But they're cute. They got a pink bag. So <laughs> All right. So these are some of the things that you can learn from the worst case scenario survival handbook. You can learn how to escape quicksand, how to jump from a moving car. See? Haven't tried that yet, but plan to. How to survive <laughs> if your parachute fails to open. Wow. And last but certainly not least, how to fend off alligators, killer bees, and sharks. So, yes. I mean, if anyone wants to borrow this afterwards, I, I'm happy to, to uh, loan it out. Oh. But it was a compilation of some, um, you know, amazing trainers. They trained seals and um, all kinds of adventurers and seals? people. Navy seals. Oh, okay. Not, right. not the, aquatic the aquatic mammal. Animal, mammal. Aquatic mammal, yeah. <laughs> Um, and part of the thing that they want us to know, first of all, tons of legal disclaimers of don't do any of this stuff, is kind of what they say in here. We're, we're not responsible for any of these things you're trying to do on your own. But they say, do not ignore the mental aspects of survival. And the idea is that just as much as we need to be prepared and have all the gear and all the things and all, you know, be, be, have the clothing that we need and the camping gear and all the, you know, warm things, we have to be able to have a mindset that says, I'm going to survive this. Mm. I'm going to live, in, as you were speaking earlier, toward eternity. That this day is lived in light of that day. Yeah. That I'm going to return. I'm going to survive whatever is going on here. And part of that requires understanding the reality of my situation. If I'm just kind of ignoring what's going on. I was thinking about bears today, too, in light of this book, that if, <laughs> if my only real interaction with bears is like, you know, Yogi or Winnie the Pooh, if I'm out in the wilderness, which probably is not going to happen that much, <laughs> um, and a bear, I come upon a bear, if, I, if my expectation is that, you know, bears are so big and fluffy and cute that they don't run very fast and they can't climb trees, I'm going to be sadly mistaken because it turns out bears can run as fast as horses up and downhill and they climb like champions. Yeah. So, yeah, that's not going to work. But the point, is, so. <laughs> the point is you only have to run faster than the person next right. to you. Right. You don't want to be alone out there. <laughs> that's exactly right. 
So, but this narrative that, back to our text, <laughs> this narrative reveals a couple things that we do not want to miss because John yeah. certainly was experiencing his worst case scenario. Yeah, right? take, take a look at this. The, and I would just kind of, in a kind of cutesy way, whatever, call it the, the, the survivalist checklist, uh, reality check. Because these are, we, we just saw in, in, in the reading and the hearing of God's word that this, there is hard, hard dealings in serving the Lord. And again, I understand that there's a tendency to not talk about these parts, but honestly, at the end of the day, our responsibility is as pastors and to build each other up is to deal with reality. And part of it is, That's right. is if this is what's going to happen in the world, we should be a people that are prepared, right? So you read this. Here's a couple of things that stand out from this teaching, just this, this narrative. First one is this. It's just obvious. No one is exempt from suffering. Think about that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right? That's, Richard's like, yes. Uh, my goodness. Uh, sweet, sweet Louise and Tommy. My, my right. goodness. It's yes. so good to see you this morning. I mean, you guys, have, we've been like rallying around the church. You guys are like, I, I almost yeah. hesitate. I know you felt this. Sharing your story of what's going on because it's like, Oh, my Lord, it would be impossible. Yeah. And yet you would be the first to say, but God, but God, that, that is a survivalist that, that mm. recognized. Guess what? I, Louise, am no lesser or more than the rest of the body of Christ. I am still a daughter of the most high God. Mm. I am still loved. Mm. God mm. loves me. He cares. Mm. He's interested mm. in what I'm doing and to bring me Amen. through the valley. Thank right. Yes, and so no right. one, somebody say no one, no one, no one is exempt from suffering. The second one is this, just a simple thought. Be careful. Be careful because there's the bears are not fluffy. They're not. They're not fluffy. Yeah. Human nature is frail yeah. and it's unpredictable. Look to the person next to you. Answer solved right there. There it is. Frail. They're looking at you, though, and like, <laughs> yeah. He's talking about you. But reality, we are all frail. I, I look at some of my tough brothers towards the back there. I look at Scott and Chad. I mean, you guys, you know, we can be tough physically on the outside, but still in the reality is our human nature. Yeah. Man, it's frail. And it is why at the end of the day, we all get to say, we need Jesus. So much. We need Jesus. Amen. And that we are overcomers. I, I just give you this verse as a reminder. Remember John's words. You are from God. And you have overcome them. Talking about the world. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? Amen. Like that's, that's, that's it. Amen. So let's go back to the story. If you got your Bibles, make sure you let's head back to, to Matthew 6. And make sure you, there's some... Really see how, yeah, great points. Take a here. look at how these points play out here because in Mark 6, it opens with the right before this narrative of John the Baptist's death, it opens with the sending out of the 12, and Jesus commissions yeah. them to go and do good things in his name. And then we have the death of John the Baptist, and then at the end of the chapter, they're coming back. They return after all these amazing things had happened. So it's kind of sandwiched in between. The going of the disciples and the coming home of the disciples. And it might be just an indication of the cost of discipleship, that if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, it right. may cost us quite a bit, in fact. And, and this, this, you know, narrative is, um, shows John, of course, as, as, a, as a forerunner of Jesus, but also not only in his life, but also in his death. That John was like the foreshadowing of, of what was going to happen to Jesus. And then, by extension, the disciples. And then, by extension, we too may be called upon to follow Christ in this way. Yeah. Um, in regard to the people in this story, we've got Herod Antipas, who is the son of Herod the Great. And he married Herodias. And she was married to Herod's half-brother. And John was saying to... Uh, to, to him and to the people, that that's not okay. That's against God's law. You're not allowed to marry your brother's wife. 
Herod, Duh. you know, <laughs> Not, I mean, no this, this was a really twisty family tree. <laughs> and another thing, so Herod the Great's How many the have dad, a family tree that you yeah, can relate it's, with? It's a little right. bit, right? No, it's just, yeah, admit, I mean, things right. don't really change that much. People are people, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we're all, we are all Twisted. frail. Okay, we, are all, <laughs> we are all subject to the human nature on, on some degree. But Herod the Great had four sons, so when you see the name Herod in the New Testament, you can know it's one of four rulers named Herod. And Herod the Great named all of his sons Herod. So, I mean, so there's no ego problem there, of course. I'm sure he's a super healthy guy. Yes. So, actually, My not first at all. Son Herod, my second son Herod. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they had enormous, enormous, just terrible, terrible sin wrapped through, through their right. family. Right. And this is who John was speaking out against, was this, this um, unlawful, ungodly marriage between the man who was supposed to be the head of the Israelite nation. Mm-hmm. And, and Herod, uh, the text tells us that he, was, um, he would hear John, he wasn't totally buying in, but he would hear him gladly, but Herodias, his wife, had a big grudge, and maybe she was afraid he was going to go back to his wife if he repented, who knows. But she was looking for an opportunity to get him mm-hmm. and to, to try to, you know, even the score there. So we have John the Baptist who's leading this national revival in preparation for the coming of Jesus. And yet in this text, in Mark 6, we see him die this humiliating, dishonoring death right. as a result of a drunken wager. I mean, it doesn't get more trite and more horrible, right? Right, right. This is shameful. And we see John going through this as a forerunner, as a foreshadowing of the kind of death that our Savior would die, as the watching world would look on and see the waste that was the death of Christ. But this is why the eternal perspective, this is why we live toward that day in toward eternity. Right. Because within the framework of the kingdom of God, everything gets new context, right? Mm. So there is nothing wasted in the kingdom of God, nothing, not even something that people would look at and go, wow, that's so embarrassing. Can't even believe that happened to the prophet of God, right? Right. Everything can be reframed (laughs) in the knowledge of the kingdom of God. It's the beautiful anticipation of of the redemptive work of God, what the enemy meant for evil, God makes for good. So we just can never discount the possibilities of what God can do in a difficult or impossible situation. It's really right. Uh, Amen. Anybody experience that? Like, yeah, I just want to absolutely. feedback a little bit on absolutely. that. Anybody experience what you thought this is absolutely utter disgrace, <laughs> and all of a sudden, because it was surrendered to God, you experienced God just show up, and God did something really cool. Amen? Yeah, right. I know Todd is back there. Amen. Yeah. Because we are never alone in the suffering, and that, that is, while we are, no one is exempt, we are never alone there. That's, and yes. uh, yeah. John 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and, and that's an amazing <clears throat> discourse where he's telling them the things that they're probably going to be facing in the next few years. John 16, 33, he says, I have said these things to you that in me you might have peace. Good. In the world you're going to have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And the Savior that we serve has overcome the world, all the things the persecutions, all the, the hate that he warned them about, all of those things, he has overcome and he is with us in the midst of it. Right. So before right. we get too deep thinking that there's no hope, we can remember also 2 Corinthians 1.5 that says that as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in his comfort as well. Yeah. Hey, uh, we, we, as a family, we're not, we're not a big <laughs> camping family. No. Um, <laughs> And uh, some of you, Chad, you've tried, you tried to help us in years past. Chad, still the best burritos I've ever eaten that morning. Yeah. <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've had some great experiences together. And so, so like day camp is like our version of, of the biggest camp week. So that's why we wore, all, wore our camp shirts today. But um, Zach, our oldest, is uniquely, uh, as a Boy Scout, loves camping. And he got, to, he got chosen to be able to go to, to Philmont. Uh, hikes. That was like 80 mile hike up yeah, in New like Mexico. Yeah, 11,000 feet or yeah, something. Yeah, just a huge, yeah. huge multi-day hike. Very rare to be able to chosen. He got to go. So now we're as a family, we have no gear for him, right? <laughs> so off we go to REI. REI. Yeah. 
three times the average price that you'd want to pay for just some simple little thing, but we wanted to make sure he was good to go. Uh, we came across, it was just a, a God, we were in, in, in the discussions, we were reminded about this guy that helped us trying to just navigate the kinds of things Zach would need, and they, they had the normal list that had already been given to us, but it was interesting, during the, 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 the guy that we ended up with had been to Philmont, we got to have a conversation with him, and he was like, that list that you have, you are only going to be partially prepared. Here's the real list, and, and the <laughs> big thing here, and this preaches, is that he had already gone before, and he knew yeah. what we needed. Yeah. And Zach, one of the oddest things was you've got to have duct tape, which, I mean, that is one thing I'm familiar with, right, for fixing everything. But he described this whole process of taking the walking stick and take, because you only have a very limited amount of pounds that you can carry in, is take the duct tape and wrap it around the handle, multiple, almost like the whole roll, a big, big portion of it, so that it would be there. That would be how you would, trans, how you would carry your duct tape with it. And he said, and we're like, are you sure this is necessary? I promise, just trust me. And guess what? Sure enough, by the time Zach got back, he, had, he used that duct tape to help about four different people, one person, their tent had, had come apart. Guess what? It was Zach that had the duct tape because he was prepared, right? So when, when Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, right, you share abundantly in Christ's sufferings. Why? So though Christ, we, we share in that, we also share in his comfort because we get to look to Jesus who has been there, help me out, and has done that. And there's victory on the other side of it. Um, this that, the statement that we had a, a earlier is to be careful. Human nature is, is, is frail, unpredictable. I think Herod's story is pretty, pretty clear here. Yeah. This is a guy that was, was almost like half in, half out. Right. And he gets caught up in, the, in the, the mayhem of the moment, the party. He had no plans to do what he ended up doing. But in it, and this is an interesting little side teaching moment. Folks, this is why we have to be so careful at the company that we keep. It just That's is. Right. We're like, we're like well, why? I need to be, I need to, I, I, it's okay to step into these spaces because after all, they need Jesus. And, and that's very relevant. But there's also this other thing that we balance out that there are, you, we know ourselves. And if you don't, get somebody around you that, can, that knows mm -hmm. you. There are certain things that are triggers. There are certain things that make you vulnerable, and we have to be aware. This, this moment, recognize that, that Herod, just like the rest of us, we are all vulnerable. The moment that we think we are above it, I'm so full of the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to do it, is a point of arrogance rather than a point of humility that, that brings us to a constant dependence. On God. Amen. So I, I just encourage part of being a survivalist is that we are faithfully cooperating with God's work so that we are well prepared. We are awake. How many times does, right, does the New Testament talk about our, our awakeness and alertness that we would have in, in no matter what situation we're faced with? That's really right. It's good to be reminded. We need, yeah. we need the reminder. Paul says that too, that it's not hard for me to remind you of Wait, these things. Yes, yeah, right? readily, readily, yeah. So why do we need to hear these stories? Because we learn, we learn from John. We learn from the example yeah. of Jesus. And uh, you're going to get all of our outdoor stories today. Actually, a couple years ago, we were on vacation in Oregon and uh, we we're hiking around the Columbia River Gorge area. Beautiful, and if you've ever beautiful. been there, you know it is just, oh my goodness, so gorgeous. And um, we have, yep, okay, so we're on this trail. And sometimes we try to challenge ourselves a little bit and just see, you know, how hard we can, how hard we can push. And we came to, there's actually a trail there. It's kind of hard to see, but we, we came to this, like, almost vertical, like, gravel-covered side of the mountain, and we were supposed to traverse this to get across to the other section. And there was a part on the trail where there had clearly been a rock slide. It had just it would washed right down, and what do we think, a couple hundred feet yeah, down. Three, four hundred, yeah, So a misstep is a, is a really big deal. 
And, um, but we knew where to step in the middle of the rock slide because somebody had, ste- had made a nice big footprint for yeah, us. I think, yeah, yeah, it's hard to tell, but next to, to the right of the stick. It was a large bear. Uh, maybe. I'm telling and, you, it was a large thank bear. Thank you. Thank you to the bear for that helping That motivated us. her to keep going. I mean, <laughs> right. it You don't want to linger in the wilderness. Uh, land keep going. shark. Yeah, that's land right. Land shark. That's right. But knowing, knowing where to step because of someone who had gone before, so certainly the, the, one of the enormous benefits of having the written word of God is that right. we can go and remind ourselves every single day, right. multiple times a day, that this is not uh, something that only happens to us. That the suffering that we face, it's, it's common to all. We all have to deal with it. And in reality, the beauty of the community of God also fits in this, in this picture as well, in that as we share our stories with each other and the ways that we've dealt with hardship and the ways that God has brought us through and right. made us overcomers, the ways, the things that we're still kind of struggling with but hanging on in faith to what he would do, this is incredibly valuable. This is, this is help for the trail, it right? Is. This is in the middle of the rock slide. <laughs> so we know where to put our feet. So yeah. we know how to keep going. So with... Back to, to back to the text here. Look at verse uh, with us on, on verse 27. So this is the, this kind of brings it home. Again, the, the detail account here is pretty intense. And immediately, so this is after the, the big episode and all the, all the dirt, excuse the term, dirty dancing. He says, and immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head like, as if it wasn't bad enough. He brought his head on a platter. Like, what a disgrace. Yeah. Um, what mockery. Brought his head on a platter, presented to the girl. The gave, girl gave it to her mother. Here's an interesting thing. Look at verse 29. He says, when the disciples heard of it, his disciples. So these were the followers. These are the guys yeah. that had been hanging with John the Baptist. And... They really, if, if, if we connect the dots, they would have been just as vulnerable of uh, the arrest and being caught up. I mean, that would have been completely common. But what do we see with these disciples as they go, they gather up his body, and they lay it in a tomb. And this detail is important. Uh, a couple things come to note here. Think of Jesus' disciples when Jesus was arrested. What, what did his disciples do? They ran away. Yeah, they bailed. And it's an interesting contrast, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. There's a little bit of a, it seems like Mark's kind of emphasizing. Of course, Mark's highly influenced by, uh, by Peter in this writing, right? So uh, now we've got the, the contrast between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples. Jesus' disciples that, that, that ran off the bail that seem, seem rather weaker. We see John's disciples, they're like, they're hardcore, you know? I mean, they, they, they go and step out into that space and get it done. Here, here's the thing that I, that I see happening with this. Um, Mark wants us to catch that this is not for us to remember John the beheaded. We're to remember John the baptizer. And, and, and watch this with me for a second. John the baptizer was active as a bold voice in the wilderness. Like you opened it up, up with. And his primary goal as the forerunner was active, his primary activity was that of baptizing people, a baptism of repentance. Here's what baptism has always represented fundamentally. It represents what? Death. Death. And if we're a little bit honest here, like, like there's just a reality, well, wait a second. When I got baptized, how many have been baptized in water? Raise your hand. Like you, you, when you signed up, did your pastor mention to you, this might mean literal, physical death? No, usually we're like, this is you getting wet, you know, right? And I think we, we, we do ourselves a disservice to, when we fail to recognize really what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ and to follow him in the waters of baptism is to follow him in his death. John was a baptizer. It's baptism of repentance. Um, if you've got your Bibles, uh, hang with me over just Romans 6. I, just, I don't have it up on the screen if, you've, if, you've, if it's available to you. Romans 6. I just want you to hear these words as we, 
we just kind of wind it, bring it together here with a, a key statement in just a second. Uh, chapter 6, verse 4, and there's such amazing words of Paul's right here. We, we were buried, therefore, with him, being Jesus, by baptism into what? Into death. Somebody say death. Like, like, like we've got to get comfortable with the reality of the prophetic vision. Right? So we'll try it again. Let's, let's try it. We're buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Yeah, death. Like, ah, oh, dead gummit, you know, right? But wait, there's the thing. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too, we too might walk in newness of life. And here's the beautiful picture. If we have been united with him in a death like his, check this out, y'all. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Somebody, now that's like, yeah, and amen, amen right? Amen. See, we didn't, we didn't do that when we were talking about death. But in order to experience the resurrection, there has to be death. So what is the death all about? It's the death of self. And we get to see it in this story that it's like, yeah. it's not about me. But when we're in the middle of the suffering, isn't that exactly what we think and feel? And that's just a real reality, isn't it? We feel it. There's this, if we're honest, we, we, we all would admit, and I'm certainly the one, like, I feel like I don't deserve this, God. Like, why, I'm trying to serve. Why is this happening to me? Um, so here's, here's, here's the invitation. I, we've been called to, to a whole different kind of faith, y'all. It's not anything like the world. And it's going to be necessary for us to cultivate a survivalist kind of faith. And let me give you, let me give you these. It's going to come about by embracing and a recognition of the union we have with Jesus Christ Amen. and the fullness of the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you all, I'm just straight up, no glossing over. This is central and foundation to walking through all of the circumstances that we have through life. How we're going to navigate this journey where there's rock slides, to, to use your illustration. How are we going to do it? We're going to do it because we are united with Christ. Somebody say united with Christ. I just united want to make sure we're Christ. getting this. This is just basic 101 theology here. We're united with Christ. And so what does that mean? Here's how it often gets described. Number one, that we are in Christ. Somebody smile. So some of you are like, I don't feel like smiling. He's going to get to the beheaded thing. There's going to be like a, a, a thing out front in the foyer. Like, I don't know what to expect. All right, so could really make for some YouTube video stuff. Oh, All right, wow. so yeah. very viral. That's very viral. Yeah. Um, so somebody say Christ in us. Oh, Christ in oh, us. I love that. Anybody yeah. love that? Yes, amen. Like, no, no, only some of us. Like, Christ in us. Yeah. Like, that is Amen. so good. Amen. Such a gift. But here's, it doesn't stop there. The union we have with Christ as believers, Pastor Peter expressed this, if you have yet to make Jesus your Lord, but once we become saved, followers of Christ, repented of our sins, he now is with, is in us, and we are in him. Yes. Like, so make sure we complete that. Sort. Wait, we're not done yet. In union with Christ, love this, we get to be like Jesus. Amen. <laughs> and the reason we might not get excited about that is because you remember how you behave driving to church this morning, yeah? Or the thoughts that went through your head, and you're like, I, where's the salvation altar call thing? Like, you know, maybe I'm not in Christ. Well, that's why we're talking about it, right? So we're in Christ. He's in us. We get to be like Jesus. And here's another beautiful. He is with us. Like he's with us. That's right. And you said that. That's why that suffering, that's why this is such a huge part 
of stepping in and through the valley of the shadow of death is that we get, we get to do it knowing that he is with us. So, so last verse. So I know we're just throwing a bunch of things out here, but, but hear this. Remember, remember with um, Stephen, I, I, I always love his story, one of the early disciples yeah, in Acts 7. That's right. And it describes a man that was going through the persecution, going through incredible suffering. And here's what was said of him. He was full of the Holy Spirit. So we're sitting here today and you, we want to ask ourselves, am I full of the Spirit? Well, we know we already have the Spirit because He dwells within us. His presence, mm-hmm. we just talked about that with the union of Christ. But are we full of the Spirit? Folks, it is essential. The days that we live in today, I mean, it's always been this. But hear me. If there was ever a day to be at the prayer meetings, <laughs> to be at the worship gatherings, mm-hmm. to be sitting on a, a Wednesday night dwell night like we have around here and just walk in the aisles and say, God, I need you. And just the emptying of self and whatever, wherever and whatever that's going to look like. But if there's ever a time that we so desperately need the fullness of the Spirit of God, where the power of God is, we are swimming in His Spirit, it is for today. That's right. And here's what it is. It's not just for us. Our other generation needs it. Others are blessed because of the spillover of the Spirit of God that's dwelling in fullness in our lives. Amen? So here, here's a verse. 2 Corinthians, sir, you want to lead, read this one? Al, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. This is like, this, this, this brings it down to the, to the greatest synthesis right here. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Wow. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Right. For the things that are seen are transient, but the <laughs> things that are unseen are eternal. And what's so, one of the things that's so powerful about this, this incredible perspective shift that Paul is calling us to in this passage, for him to call anything a light and momentary affliction, if we just think for one second about all the stuff that he went through, yeah. the stonings, the beatings, the imprisonments, adrift at sea, shipwrecked, <laughs> And that's just a little bit of it. Light that was yesterday. And, that, was, that, that was Tuesday. Yeah. That light and momentary affliction compared to eternity is his point there. Yeah. This beautiful perspective shift that we can all be uh, focused on and mindful Huge. of, that the ultimate survival, we're talking about being a survivalist, it's eternal life. It's living toward eternal life and knowing that eternity is, you know, right around the corner, friends. This, this is kind of a short little blip, even if we live 100 years. It's still pretty short compared to eternity, right? Right, right. right. So as we reframe all the things, and it, I, I love it that Paul used that phrase, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal forever and ever, amen, weight of glory, Right? So we can take the things that we're dealing with and put it within that framework. You know, we we just had a beautiful Easter uh, passion season where we look to the cross. And that's not just for Easter. That's a daily thing where we look and see what Christ did for us, right? The, The beauty, the benefit of the blood of Christ applied to our life. That Christ went ahead of us in suffering. He went ahead of us. He's with us in the midst of it. Isaiah called him a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, that there's nothing that we face that he isn't completely and intimately acquainted with. That's the Savior that we serve, right? That he loves us so much. He knows everything that we go through, that we are never alone in our difficulties and our questions. We may not get the full answer, I was thinking about Job, too. He's kind of like the, you know, the consummate sufferer in the Old Testament, right? He, uh, he went through everything. <laughs> and he's, he's asking God all of these questions for all of these chapters. And then the last four chapters, God says, okay, well, I've got a couple questions for you. 
So these are all the things, Job, that you have no control over. These are all the things that you don't understand. You know where I house the snow? Do you know when the mountain goat gives birth? Have you watched, you know, where I, where I house the lightning? Yeah. Do you know any of that? <laughs> no? Oh, okay. So, but I, you're surviving that, right? That's okay. You, can, you don't know those answers. Oh. And I think sometimes we, so we think that the answer for why this is happening, we think that would really help us out. And I think sometimes we do get to know, and sometimes it does help us. Yeah, but, but the greater revelation yeah. is God himself. Yes. The greater revelation yes. is the nature of God and how he behaves yes. toward us. And Job says that at the end. He's like, I heard about you, Lord. Yes. I questioned you with yes. all kinds of stuff that I am not ready to handle the answer on. And I, I heard about you with the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. <laughs> now my eyes have seen you, and that is the greatest gift of suffering. If there is a gift of suffering, it is the fact that God will reveal himself to us in that place and say, Ooh. I love you. I'm here with you. I paid the whole price for you to be with me in eternity. Yes. Right? Amen. 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 Yes, Amen. to God be the glory on yeah. yeah. In the thorns of life, we are invited to offer them up to the Lord as an act of worship even. Yeah. And to be with him in the midst of the suffering and he will use it as he promised to do for his glory and our good. He will. He's the Lord of the thorns. He's the Lord of glory. Amen. He's the King of glory. He takes... Man, if you haven't... We, we had, Talk to for a minute in the prayer room before coming out. Psalms 30, um, you know, he takes our weeping. Yeah. So, y'all, just, we're, we're done. But hear, hear these <laughs> final words. Um, yeah. Suffering that you may or may not be experiencing right now. Um, and praise God, right, when you're not in it. Amen. And, thankful for that. But I would just remind us, there are literally this morning, I, I journaled 17 people that I know of, part of the SWC community, many of them that are not here today, a um, couple that, that actually started to come and, and didn't even come today because they are so mm. immersed in incredible amount of suffering mm. and pain. And it would be one thing to sit and it's a thing we, we, we especially outlaw around here is a judgment, a judgmental attitude. Well, you know, yeah. because part of when we're in the middle of it, we can all relate. We can all relate to various forms of it. So it does prod us this morning that part of our ministry is to come alongside of those that are suffering, sit with them, not in judgment and Dear Lord, not to give advice, yeah, to Job's point, right? But to just sit and minister. But if you're here, and you're in the middle of it, you're listening to the sound of my voice, the hope is not the suffering in itself. The hope is seeing Jesus through the suffering. Amen. Yes. And it's our anchor that carries us through. Our Savior, the one who is the reigning king. So, we, we really, what we want to have is an increased faith in His reign and His rule that is all-powerful, that every knee has to bow to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That literally every yeah. demon that has been ever tormenting you or anyone else has to be crushed by the power of an almighty, Amen. risen Amen. Savior and King. Amen. So we don't Amen. walk around in despair and walk even in our suffering. We can be in mourning and still have victory in our soul. That's really right. This says, because my Jesus has gone before me. And I'm a follower of Him and Him alone. And guess what? We have the body of Christ that gets to come around and do it together. So, uh, sweetheart, one last picture. <laughs> All right, so um, I, didn't, I didn't check in with this one. So really? We, a trip to, we got to <laughs> Wait, do, do a you reconsider? trip oh, to okay, Alaska. Okay. <laughs> and uh, is this not the cutest picture of Joel? I mean, come on. Oh, yeah. 
Sure Come on! We love you, sir. We love you. It's going to cost. All right. Lots and lots of money. All right. So this was a, this literally, they called it Perseverance Trail, Juneau, Alaska. And my goodness, I mean, what an amazing, amazing experience that we had on going on that trail. We went on our, this little self-excursion, as you remember from my other stories. I don't usually sign up for the actual tour when you could do it for free. <laughs> oh, man. However, getting a taxi back from the trail to the ship was a whole other issue. Anyways, but on this trail, several miles, I mean, I think it was like seven that we, we did like this. like a one. thousand. <laughs> <laughs> we went in, and it was, it was stunning. But it, was, it started to rain, and the floods came. There was a reason that there was all sorts of warning signs, right? And, and I'll tell you, there was, there was oh, yeah. definitely a moment, moment, multiple moments, where it's like, you know, we just need to turn around and go back. Um, but I had seen the pictures of what was on the other side of this. And I was determined. <laughs> this is why she bought me the, yeah, worst case scenario. <laughs> so that literally when he does this, because, and it just, pictures, you know, don't do it justice, but we came around the, the other bend, around the, the other hill, and just the, the majesty of these amazing mountains and waterfalls, and just this lush, beautiful heaven <laughs> on earth kinds of moments. And so I, I invite us today to be reminded there's always hope. The story does not end in the valley. The story ends, as it were, going through the valley yes. Amen. into the blessings Amen. of God. Amen. And many times those are experienced on earth. So we should be absolutely confident. Because here's, here's the statement, the little quote that was on, this, uh, on the trailhead. Cultivate an attitude of survival. Panic or giving up will threaten your chances. <laughs> the end. Come on, let's stand and bless the Lord together. Come on, would you join me? Please, let's, let's bless the Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Our hope is not in this world. Oh, not in this world. Not in this world. Our hope is not here. It's not... It's not attached to our present sufferings. Oh, God, our hope is in the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ Amen. and the hope of our resurrection. Because death, yeah, it's been defeated Amen. by Jesus Christ Amen. and His death, Amen. His resurrection. Amen. So we sit here, stand here now, online in person. And we say, we need you, Lord. We need your grace. We need your help. And I, I'm just praying, and sweetheart, would you just close this rest of this prayer? Could I invite us? I, I, I may, we may mention of the, the need for the fullness of the Spirit. Right now, I just would, if you would get in a posture of receiving, how many are just hungry for more fullness of the Spirit? Like, Holy Spirit, I need you. Amen. I need you moving in my Amen. life afresh. Come on, be, would you begin to call out to the Lord? I, you might just call it out, I need you. Fill me, Lord. You might Amen. even just say it out loud not, with a boldness. We need you. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Please, Lord. Please. God, as we ask you for this this morning, we recognize that it may require some emptying out, mm. Lord, of, of ourselves. Right, right. Empty me, Lord, as I yes. pour myself out before you so that yes. I can have greater capacity for right. your rule in my life, Lord, for your reign, the reign of your spirit, Lord. We thank you that you Jesus. are able and willing, God, to fill us fresh every single day, Lord, yes. that it's a constant filling of your spirit, Hallelujah. that we would be um, overflowing, Lord, that we would splash, Lord, on the people that we come in contact with, God, yes. that there would be the life of the spirit, the abundance, Lord, the joy, the peace, all the fruit, Lord, that you right. promise, Father, Hallelujah. that those things would grow, God, and increase in our lives. Father, we desire yeah. this, and we thank you so much that when we ask you for that, Lord, <laughs> it's absolutely in your will, and it's something that you desire Always. to do, God. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord, that you're willing to, to stir up the hunger in us, Lord, yes. as is already uh, said this morning. Father, thank you that you are able to make us hungrier for you, Lord, and less mm. for the other things that fill mm. us at times. Mm. So mm. we thank you, Lord. Thank you are Lord. about the business of filling empty places, God. Yeah. 
We give you glory oh, and praise yes. today. How good you are, God. We thank you. Hallelujah. All honor to yes, you, Lord. Yes. We trust you. We trust you for Bless our present you. and our future, Lord. Mm. We give you all glory. In the mighty yeah. name of Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Join me, y'all. Let's bless the Lord. Amen. We praise you. Thank you. All victory is yours, Lord. Thank you, Lord. King of kings. Lord of Thank lords. You. Amen. All right, y'all. Hey, next week is Mother's Day. Yeah. So Woo-hoo. big all ladies day, actually. We we beautiful celebration. Pastor Jennifer will all be the preaching. Ladies. We're gonna have a beautiful yeah. gathering next Sunday. Don't forget Wednesday. Actually, Pace Setters is this Wednesday morning. Yes. Is that right? And then uh, Wednesday night, dwell, six o'clock. I want to bless you. Now listen, I'm gonna bless you with no more panicking. All right? Because I want to increase your chances. Yeah. I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son, and His blessed Holy Spirit. I bless you with strength and confidence in who He is. To Him be all the glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. 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 We love you, folks. God bless you.